G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Book of Peter. I pray that it will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome to this session two. Uh, we're looking at session two in the book of First Peter. Uh, we're going to cover, well, hopefully we're going to cover from verse chapter one, verse 17 to chapter two, verse 10 today. Now, uh, last session, we, we saw that the Jewish believers were scattered as a result of the persecution of Stephen. Um, and so this uh, epistle was written to instruct uh, the sheep who were scattered uh, by letter rather than by personal instruction because uh, uh, um, the apostles remained in Jerusalem for a while before they then uh, went out into the dispersion. Um, Peter, who is Peter? Well, Peter was, the, was an apostle or is an apostle and he was uh, the leader. He, he, he headed up the apostolic group. He was also the apostle to the Jews. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. So as I said, he stayed in Jerusalem for a time. Uh, then later on, uh, Peter left for the diaspora and he arrived in Babylon. And Babylon in that day was the center of Judaism outside the land. Peter writes to Jewish believers who are living outside the land. That's, that's the dispersion. And they're living alongside pagan Gentiles. And uh, his epistle, this first epistle deals with the persecution that they face as believers. And so he's writing to encourage them. And he's writing to tell them that, you know, glory comes through persecution and suffering. Now, in the section that we left off last time, we are in the character of the believer, and uh, there are three things that Peter says that we need to conform to. Uh, one was God the Father, one is going to be their redemption and love. Peter says that since we have a new life, which is a new life in Christ, this is what he's talking to these uh, believers, we should live it. Now, how are we to live it? We are to conform to God the Father uh, by, uh, first of all, he says, we are to gird up the loins of your mind. Uh, what, what that really means is don't become slack or, or loose-minded. Uh, in fact, what he's saying is that, you know, to gird up your mind means to have a disciplined mind. And then second, he says, be sober. He's not talking about be, being drunk here with, with alcohol. But what he's, he's talking about here is to be able to see things clearly uh, and, and to not get thrown off balance by every, every wind of doctrine that comes along. Now, he goes on to say that obedience is their character and it's a sign that they are true believers and they are called to live a life of holiness. Now, uh, what's the standard of holiness? Well, God the Father. God is that standard. Uh, because he says, just as he is holy, we have been called to live holy lives, and we should be characterized by holy living in all areas of our daily living. And, and by doing that, we are imitating our Father in heaven. Um, so we're called to conform to God the Father, and, and now we come to the second area that we have to conform to, and that is uh, their redemption or, or our redemption. Now, in verses 17 to 21, we have this conformity to their redemption. And if you call on him as father, who without respect of persons judges according to each man's work, pass the time of your sojourning in fear knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb without spot, even the blood of Christ, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was manifested at the end of times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, that raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope might be in God. So here in verse 17, Peter implies that in conforming uh, to their redemption, believers are to call on the Father. 
He says, if you call on him as father. Well, the, the, the reality is that, is that they are now children of God and therefore they can approach God as father and especially in prayer. So God called them, uh, these believers, and they are to respond by calling on him while addressing him as father, which is a very uh, a personal, endearing term. Prayer is always to be addressed to God the Father. There is never any basis to address prayers to either the Son or the Spirit. Always to God the Father. Now, as the impartial judge, God the Father judges each man without regard to status. And literally, uh, the Greek word for re without respect means without receiving of face. Uh, this, is a, this is a very strong Hebraism. Um, it's Peter's uh, own statement is recording, recorded in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, where he says, of a truth, I, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. This is an Old Testament truth, uh, which is also found in Deuteronomy 10, 17, uh, where you know Moses writes that uh, God does not regard persons nor take reward. He doesn't take bribes. Now, it also it is also Paul's teaching uh, in Romans two eleven and Ephesians six nine and Colossians three twenty five. Now Peter continues by saying that God judges according to each man's work. So the emphasis here is upon individual judgment. They are each judged according to their works. What do they do with what God has given them? And for that reason, uh, because they're going to be judged each man according to his works, for that reason, these believers need to pass the time of your sojournings in fear. Now, he addressed again here, he addresses the concept of alien residence. When I say alien, not alien from outer space, but it's not their home. <laughs> He's speaking literally of Jews in the diaspora. Remember the diaspora, that is, um, that is a technical term for Jews who are outside the land of Israel. So those Jews who are living here in Australia are part of the diaspora. Um, so he's saying here, uh, he's speaking literally of the Jews in the diaspora, but it, this is also um, spiritually true as well. Uh, we need to pass a time of our sojourning here in this land because you and I, this is not our home either. We're simply passing through. So their, their sojourning is to be passed in fear. What does that mean? It, it simply means to be passed in awe of God. A uh, reverent fear is evidenced by a, a very um, um, a tender conscience. It's, it's, a, it's a watchfulness against temptation, and it's avoiding uh, things that would displease God. So these, these Jewish believers here should also be strangers to their former empty way of life. Um, you know, the term... Uh, sojourner here uh, separates these Jewish believers from the world from which they have been saved and connects them now to a new commonwealth and that's the commonwealth of, of all believers. And then in verse 18 he says you know Peter emphasizes the redemption here and he begins by positively addressing the fact that you were redeemed uh, and the word redeemed means, uh, to pay a ransom. So these believers were delivered by the payment of a ransom. And in the Greek, this is in the what they call the IRS tense, which means that it's, it's something that has been previously done. It's, like, it's a fact. Uh, the fact is that a, a ransom was paid for you and I. Uh, and so redemption is now a finished work. And also, uh, in the Greek, it is passive. What does that mean? It means it's not something that you and I did. 
it was the work of somebody else who did it on our behalf. And, and in this instance, it was the work of, of Jesus the Messiah. It was the work of Jesus Christ. He was the one who paid the ransom on our behalf. We, we, we couldn't do it. And now Peter, he now negatively addresses the fact that it was not with corruptible things, with silver or gold. Uh, corruptible things we know are perishable and they're subject to decay and destruction. Uh, you know, Peter recorded back in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, he says, uh, silver and gold have I none, but what I have that I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ, he says to the, to the lame guy, he says, walk. <laughs> you know, and, and so Peter said, I, I got no silver and gold, fellas, but what I do have, uh, I got something which is really valuable, and that is the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ. So Peter recorded, and he views these things to be silver and gold, to be of no value in so, insofar as the spiritual life is concerned. They, they can't buy your salvation. However, these believers were redeemed from their vain manner of life. Now, what's their vain manner of life? Well, remember, first century, first century Israel, uh, Pharisaism was the, the predominant uh, Judaism. Um, and so they were um, redeemed from their vain manner of life, which was Pharisaism. Uh, they were redeemed from Mishnaic Judaism, which was a Judaism which was handed down from your fathers, from, from their, their previous fathers. And when we talk about Mishnaic Judaism, what we're talking about here is what you see in the Gospels. Often you will see uh, the traditions of the elders or, or, you know, the oral traditions. These are those uh, laws uh, that they, that the uh, rabbis made which were outside of uh, the written commands of God. These were the laws that they made up and these are the laws that they live their life by. And so um, uh, Peter is saying that they were redeemed from that empty manner of life uh, because that life could not save anyone. In the past, uh, these traditions always had, uh, and in, in present, uh, present time, they continue to have a very strong pull on the Jewish people. Uh, and so they'll always talk about the Talmud, which is where everything is banged together in the Talmud. Um, this, these are all the oral traditions and stuff. So Peter points out that regardless of how, how old uh, these traditions are, uh, because they're handed down from their forefathers, uh, their antiquity does not prove the correctness of any opinion or doctrine. Just because they're old, it doesn't mean it's a good doctrine. And so these Jewish believers have been redeemed out of that vain manner of life, which was a rabbinic Judaism, and, but it was not done with gold or silver. In verse 19, he continues on by using a positive approach now regarding the issue of redemption by stating its price. And the price of redemption was the blood of the Messiah. So gold and silver couldn't purchase it, but the blood of Messiah could. That redemption is a purchasing from the marketplace of sin. Now, his blood was precious. It was of high value because Jesus was the Lamb of God, which we find in John chapter 1, verse 29. And uh, similar to the sacrificial lambs, which were to be without defect, Peter emphasizes Jesus as the Passover lamb, as a lamb without spot and without blemish. And you can find that in uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse, 5, uh, verse 5, and Leviticus 22, verses 19 to 20. Also, Deuteronomy 15, 21 speaks about that as well, uh, that the Passover lamb was a lamb without spot and without blemish. Now, Christ was sinless. So he was uniquely qualified uh, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, when it says without spot, it means Jesus remained unstained from the evil around him. 
he was an alien. He was a sojourner as well. And for that reason, in verse 20, uh, Peter writes that Jesus was set apart for the work of redemption. Um, here again, Peter uses the word foreknown, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world. Now back in chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, we, we read back there that the believer was foreknown, and this foreknowledge included the redemptive foreknowledge of God. Now, Peter here points out that the Redeemer himself, uh, that Jesus himself, was included in the redemptive foreknowledge of God. Uh, again, the word foreknown, it means to know ahead of time because of pre-planning. So because of pre-planning, something is known ahead of time, and that's to be foreknown. Now, before the foundation of the world, God foreknew and planned the whole redemptive program. You know, Jesus was chosen to be the redeemer before the creation of the universe and before there were any sinners who needed to be redeemed. And now, in verse 20, at the appointed time, he was now manifested to them. He now appeared in human history. He was manifested at the end of times for your sake. He's writing to his, these believers and he said he was manifested at the right time in human history for your sake. And here again, the word manifested is in the IRS tense. And it simply states that this is a fact. It states the fact that an action has happened. And, and what we see here, this is a summary of the whole first coming. The fact that he appeared at the end of times. And the end of times was when he appeared incarnation. And this is a, so this is the whole first coming into one hit here. Now, the Greek word for times here is the origin of the word chronology. Chronology. It refers to successive periods of human history until the fullness of time came, as written in, in what we see in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4, and Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Um, so what we see here is that, you know, this payment for sin was planned before the creation of the world, and it was revealed for people's sake through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He came uh, for, for our sake because all of this was for the sake of believers. So the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Christ were not the result of, you know, oh boy, we've, the world's mucked up. We better change the plan here. No, it, it wasn't a change of purpose to meet some unforeseen circumstances. They were foreseen and they were foreordained in the eternal counsel of God. All this was because of pre-planning. Okay. Now, in verse 21, Peter writes about the results of this redemptive work uh, of Jesus. He says, for Jesus, uh, the result here, we have two aspects. Uh, first aspect was the resurrection. He was raised from the dead. Now, wh why do we believe in God? Because he raised Jesus from the dead. And by it, God declared openly his acceptance of him as a righteous substitute. So that was the first aspect. Jesus was raised from the dead. The second aspect was glorif glorification. Because he was now given glory. And this refers to the, Jesus always had glory, but in his humanity, that, that, that glory was, was clothed in his, in his humanity. So here it says he was given glory. Well, this refers to the restoration of the unveiled glory of the Shekinah at the ascension. So it's now been restored to him. Now, the implication here is that 
in Jesus's resurrection, the, uh, the believer has the assurance that he too will be raised from the dead. So the basis of our faith is, is the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, uh, you know, the apostle Paul says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been, has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He says that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 to 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 14. So the results for the believers now also involves two aspects. First of all, they became believers. And secondly, they now have faith and hope in God. It says, so that your faith and hope might be in God. So that, you know, is wrapped up in the resurrection of, of Jesus. That's why we have faith in God, because of the resurrection. Now, come, we come now to the third area of, of conformity, and that is conformity to love. And we find this in, uh, again, this is in the, uh, uh, Peter is dealing with the character of the believer here. And, uh, you know, we had, we had, uh, we had God, uh, we had to be conformed to God the Father, uh, conformed to our redemption, and now we are going to be uh, called to uh, a conformity to love in chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Uh, Peter writes, seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another from the heart fervently, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides. So here in verses 22 to 23, this is what we just seen here, 22 and 23. Uh, Peter issues the command to love. He says, love one another from a fervent heart. Now, the Greek word for love here is agape which is uh, the love brought forth by a man's will. A, a man decides to love. Um, it is to be a mutual love. It, it says love one another. Now, the source of this love should be from the heart. And the intensity of this love should be fervent. Uh, and this kind of love is to be expressed in its fullest capacity. So Peter presents the basis for the command to love, and he now points out four aspects here. The first aspect is their purified souls. Now, this is dealing with moral purification. This is not ceremonial, uh, and it's not external. It is moral. It is a moral purification and remember, he's talking to Jews, just so they understood in their purification, you know, it could be simply be a, a, a washing, it could be a ceremonial cleansing. So what he's talking about here is it's a, it's a moral uh, uh, purification. It, it, their souls have been purified. And the second aspect here is the obedience to the truth. Now, this is the area in which purification operates. It's a, it's a reaffirmation of points that Peter made uh, in verses 2 and 14. Now, this is not the means of purification, but it does relate to the human attitude that allows the spirit to purify. And, and what's that? It is obedience to the truth, obedience to the revealed truth. Uh, and so in the, in the Greek, the word truth has a definite article, so it is the truth, and so the truth is the gospel. The obedience here is not the obedience of works, but it is actually the obedience of faith. It's the obedience of faith in the good news, and the good news is what the Bible tells us. The third aspect here is onto unfeigned love of the brethren. Now, this is the result produced in the heart by purification. So when there is obedience uh, to the truth, the heart is now purified. And so we now have the result being uh, 
on fine love of the brethren. Now, the Greek word here uh, uh, is Philadelphia. Uh, this is the love, love of the brethren. Philadelphia is a word that is used only of love between believers in the New Testament. It's the only time it's used. Now, this love should be on find, which means it should be without hypocrisy. It should be without hypocrisy. And because of this Philadelphia love, which is the love of the brethren, believers should now love, and the love here is agapeo, uh, they should now love one another from the heart fervently. So uh, because of, uh, we have the, the unfeigned love of the brethren, which is the Philadelphia love, uh, because of the Philadelphia love, uh, believers should now agape love one another from the heart fervently. You know, reading it in English, you just see love and love, but uh, two different Greek words there, Philadelphia, love of the brethren, and agape love, which is a, a love of the will. Now, the fourth aspect Peter talks about is having been begotten again through the word of God, which lives and abides. In other words, believers were born the first time with corruptible seed. And that was the seed of Adam. This seed of natural life is subject to decay and death. So this is natural human regeneration, uh, human generation. Yet, because uh, they have been regenerated, because of their regeneration when they accepted the messiah when they placed their trust and faith in messiah to save them believers were born the second time with the incorruptible seed which is the word of god so this word of god is not subject to decay and death it is incorruptible it's not going to disappear it will be there all the time it has the same nature as the inheritance of uh, back in verse four, where it is, uh, it, it 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 is incorruptible. It, it's uh, it can't fight away. It cannot become degenerate. It is supernatural and divine generation. It is a regeneration, uh, and that means it, it's it is not it is it is imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. The means of this regeneration is the word of God. Yeah, word of God. Yes, but the word of God is living and abiding. And by use of the word living, Peter means that it is actively possessing life. It, it is alive. The word of God is alive. And, and by the use of the word abiding, he means it is permanent. It's not going to change. It, the word of God is relevant uh, today as much as it was relevant in the first century Israel. And it will be relevant in you know, uh, the, the, the 22nd century. It will always be relevant. And the Greek word, the Greek word for the term word is logos, which emphasizes the totality of the word in both it's spoken and written form. Uh, and the Greek word used here for seed is the word sporos. And, and this form is used here and nowhere else. Yeah. Because these believers have been regenerated by the word of God, the result of that should be they love. That, that's the, that should be the result. And in verses 24 and the first part of 25, Peter now provides the proof for this truth. And, and these verses here contain a quotation from Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. Uh, and, and the quote from Isaiah proves that the word of God lives and abides. Because human existence, which includes human glory, is transitory like grass, all of man's achievements are transitory as well, but the word of God is not transitory. And in verse 25, 
the Greek term used for word here is not logos, but rhema, which is now the spoken word or the proclamation of the gospel. So again, we see just a Greek, you know, it's just an amazing language. In the second part of verse 25, Peter now makes the application. And this is the word of God, uh, the, this, sorry. And this is the word of good tidings, which was preached unto you. So what we see here is that this is the evangelization that leads to regeneration. It is the acceptance of the message that now resulted in the regeneration of these Jewish believers. You know, how can they believe unless they have heard, Paul says. So evangelization needs to be done so that regeneration can take place. And through the living and abiding word, which is the gospel, their spiritual security is assured, if not their physical security. You know, their spiritual security is certainly assured it cannot be lost now we're going to come to look at the remnant and the non-remnant which we see in chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 now we need to keep in mind here that peter is writing to jewish believers um, because remember right back at the start he says he's writing to the dispersion technical term for the jews outside the land and, and also, he's the, he's the apostle to the Jews. Now, throughout scripture, uh, there are always two Israels. We have Israel, the whole, which comprises all Jews. And then we have Israel, the remnant, that comprises only believing Jews. So within the, the whole, all the remnant of Israel, within that whole Israel, all the Jews, there is a small part of it which are the remnant which comprise the believing jews yeah you know, here peter is going to distinguish between the remnant with the believing jews and the non-remnant who are the non-believing jews now we see the spiritual state of the remnant in uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 Putting away, therefore, all wickedness and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes long for the spiritual milk which is without guile, that you may grow thereby unto salvation. If you have tasted, the Lord is gracious. So, so in dealing with the, with the remnant and the non-remnant, Peter begins in verses 1 to 3 by describing the spiritual state of the remnant. These are the believers, the remnant. In verse 1, when Peter states, therefore, right, putting away therefore, it shows that what he's about to say is based on what we've just covered in verses 23 to 25, the previous segment. Uh, and that was, con what was that concerning? That was concerning the eternal word of God. So based upon what we said about the eternal word of God, therefore, he then lists some attitudes and actions that are to be rejected or put away, you know, as believers through the, the good word of God, put these things away. Now, Peter views these attitudes and actions as all clothing that must be stripped from the body and flung away because they have become thoroughly useless and badly stained. And now Peter, the, he's going to list the, the list of these. He's going to we're going to have these five attitudes and actions that he's, he lists here, including first one, all wickedness. Now, this refers when he, when he says all wickedness. This refers to all kinds of evil conduct, and it's a general term for moral evil in every form. And then, secondly, we have all guile. Uh, now, this is including uh, deceit, cunning, and craftiness. And then, third, we have hypocrisies, 
And this involves all forms of pretenses. And then fourth, we have envies. And envies, these are the feelings of displeasure when a believer hears of blessing or prosperity for someone else. That's envies. We should be joyous when somebody else is blessed. And then fifth, we have all evil speaking. Now, this is a Greek word that appears only here and in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20. And it refers to the misuse of the tongue. It's, uh, it's, it regards speech that degrades another person. It tears down another person. Now, in verse 2, Peter presents what must be sought to replace those things that are to be put away. He describes the believers here as newborn babes, and he uses a Greek word that is used of a child at birth, and you find the same word used in Luke chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 16. Also Luke 18, verse 15 and Acts 7, verse 19. So Peter is identifying them as new believers. Now, as is always true, new believers need spiritual milk. And Peter admonishes them long for the spiritual milk uh, as, as babes long for milk, which is their proper food uh, uh, and the only food necessary for them. These, these newborn babes should long for the spiritual milk. You, you know, a, a babe, when it's born, you don't have to teach them how to, how to long for milk. It just goes for it. And same as a new believer, the reaction of a new believer should be just to to go to the milk of the word and, and start getting stuck into it. As newborn babes, long for the, for the milk, the spiritual milk, which is without guile. Uh, the Greek word here for spiritual is a word that is used only here. And again, in Romans 12, verse 1, as, as a spiritual element that is without guile, which means that there's nothing crafty or deceitful in its nature. The milk is the basics of the word of God. It, and this is necessary for young believers. They need this milk in order to grow spiritually. It, it says, Peter goes on to say, you know, you need this milk that you may grow thereby. You don't have this milk, you're going to be malnourished. The needed growth comes from the milk of God's word to grow onto salvation. And this is the goal to be reached from the partaking of, of this, of this uh, spiritual milk. So the purpose, the purpose of the believer's um, present spiritual growth is to move them toward their future salvation in all its fullness, in all of its full grown maturity, which is the future facet of salvation spoken of by Peter back in chapter one. Uh, essentially, the purpose of partaking of spiritual milk is to grow toward maturity so that believers can begin to partake of the meat of God's word. You know, um, we, we, we don't see, um, um, you know, grown, grown people uh, um, still drinking the, spirit, the, 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 the physical milk of a baby. It, it's, uh, it's not normal. They need to be on the on lamb chops, need to be on meat of the word. And then in verse 3, Peter notes these Jewish believers have, have already experienced the Lord is good. He says, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So the yearning for milk is to be based on past experience. They have already tasted that the Lord is good. They had experienced God's grace in their new birth. And had found that indeed the Lord is good. It's just the Lord is just fantastic. And then this should now encourage the believers to continue partaking of the milk until they are ready to begin partaking of the meat. And the word tasted here means it means to act, actual uh, appropriation. And the believers have actually appropriated the fact that God is gracious. 
we, we know it by experience. And uh, Peter's statement here is based upon Psalm 34, verse 8, where the psalmist says, Oh, taste and see that Jehovah is good. So the spiritual state of the remnant is characterized as newborn babes in need of the milk of God's word. And this milk will now enable them to continue growing until they are ready to partake of the meat. Now, at the moment of salvation, a child is born, uh, you know, a, a, a child is born with an appetite for the word of God, just as a newborn infant immediately starts to eat. And then in verse four, we see the, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Here we have the living stone, the phrase, unto whom coming uh, means <clears throat> that these Jewish believers have come to the Messiah, the living stone. And this coming is a personal, habitual approach. Um, that, that's what it means in the Greek. Uh, it's, an, it's an intimate association of communion and fellowship between believers and their Messiah, believers and their Lord. And the, the, um, the living stone that we see here, the living stone, the Greek word means it's a prepared stone, uh, such as the stones that are used in the construction of a building. And so Jesus is the messianic stone of the Old Testament. And he is a stone that was rejected by men. And that, uh, this was prophesied of him in Psalm 118, verse 22. And it would, was fulfilled, we see, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. In, the, in Matthew, we see it in, 12, uh, in 21, sorry, verse 42 to 44. And Mark 11, verse 10 to 11. Luke 20 verse 17 to 18, and we see it also in Acts chapter 4, verse 11. Now, he was elect, which means he was chosen by God the Father, and he was precious, which means that he was of high value. Now, as believers uh, rejected by the world, uh, we can take heart in the knowledge uh, that, you know, we too are elect and we too are valued by God, which, you know, Peter tells us this back in chapter 1, verse, verse 1 and verse 18. Okay. In verse 5, he says, you also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. Now, in contrast to the living stone, the Messiah, which we see in the first part of verse 5, we see it contains the plural there as living stones. Uh, Messiah was the living stone. Now we see this living stones. And this is in reference to these Jewish believers he's talking, uh, Peter's writing to here. Uh, and because they have salvation, they are also living stones. They have become partakers of Messiah. Uh, they can partake of his living nature and are part of a spiritual house as, as, as are all believers. Every believer is part of this spiritual house. Every believer is a living stone. But we're talking, Peter's talking here to these uh, Jewish believers. You also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. So they are spiritual uh, since as living stones if they're living stones, they have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit and they belong to him. Otherwise, they'd be dead stones. And the house here, what we see here, uh, a spiritual house, the house that he's talking about here is, is the, um, it's the, it's the Israel of God that we see back in, we see in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, Galatians 6, 16. Now, the Israel of God is not comprised of the church, but the Israel of God is comprised of the Jewish believers. The term Israel of God is equivalent to the term the remnant of Israel. You are being built up. Now, this is a present 
continuing reality because they are in the process of being built up onto a spiritual house. All of us are being continually built up, being built up onto a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, the second part of verse five, to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So here in the second part of verse five, Jewish believers are also identified as a holy priesthood. Now the word holy it means, to be, means to be set apart as belonging to God. And this includes Peter's call for the details of their holiness back in chapter one, verses 14 to 17. Now in the New Testament, the Greek word for priesthood is, uh, is only found twice. We find it in this verse and again in, in verse nine. In the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the word priesthood is also found only twice. I, one of them is Exodus 19 verse six, and the other one is Exodus 23 verse 22, where it is used to describe Israel as a royal priesthood. The task of the priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God, because you know, the God is the object of what we are offering spiritual sacrifices to. Uh, he is the object of who we are offering spiritual sacrifices to. Now, the sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, uh, these are, what this does is this portrays Jesus as the mediator. Our, our sacrifices are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our mediator. Now, what do these sacrifices that are acceptable to God include? Well, Peter doesn't tell us what they are, but other passages do. Uh, these sacrifices include, for instance, the living sacrifices of the body, which we see in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. We see also praise, Hebrews 13, verse 15. Self-dedication, Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 2, and Philippians 2, 17. Good deeds, Hebrews 13, 16. Material possessions that are sacrificed or given over for God's service we find in Philippians 4, verse 18, and Hebrews 13, verse 16. So there, there are what that? one, two, three, four, five. There, there are five um, sacrifices that we see in other passages of Scripture. Now, Peter's point here is that not only Jewish believers, only the remnant, have fulfilled Israel's original calling to be a kingdom of priests as described in Exodus 19.6. Only the Jewish, only Jewish believers, only the remnant have fulfilled that to be a kingdom of priests um, for Israel. The rest of Israel, the non-remnant, has failed. Now, uh, quite often interpreters who ignore the context have often used this verse in an attempt to teach that the kingdom of priests is inclusive of the whole church. However, the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers cannot be supported from this verse. Peter is speaking specifically of Jewish believers in this context. It is a fact that all believers are a spiritual priesthood, but this fact is based on Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and Revelation 5, verse 10, and Revelation 20, verse 6. That's where we see all believers as a spiritual priesthood. Verse 6 to 8, or verse 6 and 7, let's do that. That's the state of the remnant. Because it is contained in Scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone elect precious and he that believeth in him shall not be put to shame for you therefore that believe is the preciousness but for such as disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected the same was made the head of the corner so having pointed out that uh, jewish believers are living stones and the holy priesthood now we see in verses six to eight 
Peter begins to draw a distinction between the remnant and the non-remnant by describing the state of the remnant in, in these two verses, six and seven. He quotes Isaiah 28, verse six in, in, uh, in verse six. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. The stone is Jesus the Messiah, who is both elect and precious, according to verse four. And in this case, he is not merely a stone, but he is the chief cornerstone. And the Greek word for chief cornerstone is used only here and in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. The, the word chief cornerstone refers to a stone that is lying at the extreme corner, and this one stone controls the foundation lines of the building. So we see that, uh, that Christ, the chief cornerstone, cor chief cornerstone, and then we had uh, uh, built on by the apostles and the, by the doctrine of the apostles and the prophets. So he was, he sets things all straight. He that believeth him should not be put to shame. Now, the stone, what we see here is those who believe on the stone will not be ashamed or disappointed uh, due to a failure on the part of the stone, because the stone will never fail them. Now, in the context of that Isaiah passage, the prophet makes a distinction between the remnant and the non-remnant. And then we see in the first part of verse 7, Peter uses the word therefore to make the application. Therefore, the stone is precious. However, the stone is precious only for the believing Jewish remnant. The phrase for you is in the emphatic position in the Greek text. For you, precious is the stone for the remnant. Because remember, Isaiah was talking about the remnant as well, and, and Peter here is writing to the, the Jewish believers in dispersion, writing to the Jewish remnant. Now, what we see here at this point, <clears throat> for you therefore that believe uh, is a preciousness, but, but for such as disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, the stone was made the head of the corner. Now, so at this point here in, in, in second part of verse 7 and verse 8, Peter now describes the state of the non-remnant. Verse 7 contains a quote from Psalm 118, verse 22, to demonstrate the predicted rejection of the stone. The Greek word for rejected means to be disapproved. So in the same way, that the leadership of Israel disapproved of Jesus. He was rejected or disapproved of by the builders who were the leaders of Israel. Now, even though Jesus as the stone was disapproved of by the leaders, God overruled the leaders and designated him to be the head of the corner. And the fulfillment of this will occur with the second coming and the messianic kingdom. In verse 8, we see a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Uh, they stumble at the word, uh, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, um, here in the first part of verse 8, we see a quotation from Isaiah 8, verse 14. Again, the context of that verse also distinguishes between the remnant and the non-remnant. And Peter describes the stone in two ways here. First of all, he is the stone of stumbling. He is a stone against which one accidentally strikes and injures himself. And second, he is the rock of offense. So this rock of offense, this is a trap set up to trip someone up, causing a large boulder to fall upon him. So, <coughs> excuse me. Peter's point is this. By rejecting a God's stone, the non-remnant bring upon, self, upon themselves the injury of the stone and the ruin of the block. When tripping over a stone, one just injures himself. However, when a big boulder lands on top of a person, it kills him. So the non-remnant stumble over the messiahship of Jesus. And as a result, the boulder falls on them and crushes them. And this is a, ref a reference here to the AD 70 judgment, which is coming.
in the second part of verse 8, Peter gives the application, the non-remnant, the non-remnant stumbled. Uh, and the means of stumbling was disobedience to the word. And furthermore, to this day, the non-elect were appointed. They were appointed to this. And the Greek word for appointed means to appoint or to destine to something. So those who rejected the word were destined to stumble at the stone of stumbling. But you are an elect, verse 9, you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, Peter has just described the non-remnant. Peter now refers to the remnant and describes them in verses 9 to 10. He describes the position of the Israel of God, the remnant of Israel, and he uses four characteristics. First up, this is based upon Isaiah 43.20, they are an elect race. Now, they are elect, why? Because they were chosen by God's own initiative, uh, which we saw back in it, which we saw back in chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 6. Again, Peter here is not referring to the church as a whole. The church is not a race of people, but it's composed of believers of all races. Nevertheless, the Jewish people are a race in the biblical sense, and the Jewish believers are the elect race, the Israel of God. The second characteristic Peter uses to describe the Israel of God is that they are a royal priesthood. Now, verse 5 identifies the Jewish believers as a holy priesthood to emphasize the fact that they have the right to enter the heavenly sanctuary. Now they're called a royal priesthood. Why? Because Jesus is king. And according to Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 28, his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedekian priesthood was a royal priesthood, for Melchizedek was both priest and king. Jesus is also both priest and king. By the same token, Jewish believers are of a royal priesthood. Again, the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers is a true doctrine. However, we can't support it from this verse that is specifically addressing Jewish believers. Peter's point here is that in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, the nation of Israel was called to be a nation of priests, a national priesthood. The nation failed, but the believing remnant has not failed. They are fulfilling this calling. The third characteristic Peter uses to describe the Israel of God is that they are a holy nation. Now, Israel became a nation at Sinai and became holy through their separation from the whole of humanity. They were set apart. Jewish believers are distinct from all Israel because they are the believing remnant. And this cannot be said of the church because the church is not a nation. In fact, in Romans chapters 9 to 11, Paul refers to the church as a non-nation because the church is comprised of believers from all nations, but the church as an entity is not a nation. The Jewish believers as the Israel of God, do comprise a holy nation. So it, again, it, it highlights to us that Peter is writing to Jewish believers, the remnant. The Jewish, uh, what we see here is that the fourth characteristic now Peter used to describe the Israel of God is that they are a people for God's own possession. This statement is based on Deuteronomy 7, 6 and 14, 2 and 26, verse 18. Also, the prophet Isaiah in 43, 21 and Malachi, Malachi 3, 17. Now, Peter identifies them as a people. Now, through Abraham, the Jews became a people 
And during the time of Moses, they became a nation, a nation for God's own possession. Jewish believers were purchased by the blood of Messiah, and they uniquely belong to God. Therefore, these four characteristics of Jewish believers distinguish the remnant from the non-remnant. They are an elect race. They're a royal priesthood. They're a holy nation. They're God's own possession. This is only for the remnant, not the non-remnant. Now, Peter describes the purpose of their calling to show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, the Greek word for show forth means to make it widely known. And this refers to a proclamation of a message to those outside. The emphasis here is on their evangelistic function. It's to spread the news of God's excellencies. Uh, and in what we see here, the, the word excellencies is used only four times in the Greek New Testament. Uh, three times it's used by Peter uh, here. And then in 2 Peter 1, verse 3 and verse 5, also used by Paul in Philippians 4, verse 8. Now, the term excellencies refers to all of God's attributes. Almost finished. The phrase, he is the one who called you, is a reference to the point of salvation. Theologically, uh, this term is the effectual calling. This remnant was called into salvation. They were called out of darkness and into light. Darkness is the kingdom of Satan. Light is a kingdom of the Shekinah glory light, the kingdom of God. And the background for this teaching comes from Isaiah 43, verse 20 to 21, which states, the people which I formed for myself, that they may set forth my praises. Okay. Who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So finally, we see here in verse 10, Peter refers to Hosea chapter 1, verse 10 to chapter 2, verse 1, and uh, also um, 2, verse 23. In the context of Hosea, the prophet is speaking of national Israel. Positionally, Israel is always the people of God, but experientially, they may not experience the benefits of this position due to disobedience. And for a period of time, Israel is experientially not my people. But in the future, they're going to repent one day and become my people again. So Peter applies this passage to the remnant. He contrasts their former state when they're unbelievers with their present state. Formerly, they were members of the non-remnant, and externally, they were not God's people, and internally, they had no divine mercy. Presently, they have externally become my people, God's people, God's end possession, and internally, they have obtained mercy. The Hosea context deals with Israel, uh, that for a period of time, Israel, experientially at least, was not to be God's people. However, we know that in the future, when Israel undergoes a national salvation, they'll again experientially become my people. So what will be true of Israel as a nation in the future is true of the remnant of Israel in the present. They have experientially become God's people again because they are now members of the believing remnant, the Israel of God. And it's important here to recognize that the contrast he, he makes here is not between the church and Israel or between believers and non-believers or between unbelieving Jews and believing Jews. But the contrast here is between the remnant and the non-remnant. And that is your lot for today. Study hard and grow strong. Thank you for coming along.